Okay, so, okay, where we last left off here, um, I gave the general form of how you find the first order kinematic coefficient uh, using uh, measurements between uh, instant centers. So for this approach, of course, you have to have a drawing drawn to scale. You have to find all the instant centers. Uh, but then how do you know what distances or what instant center distances to measure to find the first order kinematic coefficients? Well, if you just follow this rule, you can find them. Okay? Um, so it's always uh, theta j, uh, some output variable, is the first order kinematic coefficient, so prime equals, and this is kind of a new convention shown here, we're hopping back from convention from the book and convention in, in my notes, but uh, pretty easy to, to follow. Um, P is the, uh, you know, instant center, um, and the two indices there that the, tell you what instant center the two bodies are being compared with. Uh, just like this is P24, that's P1, uh, you know, J or 1I or whatever. Um, and if you draw the bar over the two P's, that's basically saying, the line that connects those two instant centers, whereas this is like an, uh, an R vector and you put the two things in there. So it's the same thing, okay? But, but just follow me here. So basically it says if you want to find theta J prime, you use P1I and PIJ. And of course the order of those don't matter. It could be PIJ and P1I. And even the indice order doesn't matter. It could be 1I or one, I1 or IJ or JI, right? So let's see if it's the same uh, we, you know, we derived this in the last um, video. We, we went through and um, derived that. Uh, but let's see if it works. So P1I, where in this case I was, is the input variable, which is 2. So P21, that corresponds to P12 there. Okay? And then PIJ, or the input's 2. The output in this case is 4. J is 4. So here we have P24, which is P24 there. So great. So this represents the same, uh, you know, a distance here, okay? From both conventions in the numerator, we've got that distance. And then you look at the bottom, and it would be P1J, which is P14, which is right here, P41, and PIJ, which is P24 here. So it's this distance, okay? So if you just follow this, almost no matter what the scenario is, and memorize that, it'll tell you uh, what two lengths to measure between different pairs of instant centers uh, to find the ratio to find the instant center. Then, of course, you just take that and multiply it by the input omega 2 in this case, and you would get omega 4, and you've done velocity analysis. Now, this doesn't tell you the sign, um, but you, can, you could use this, uh, this you know, um, convention that we've already discussed to find the sign. Um, so, basically says if PIJ, which is P24, this one, lies outside of P1I and P1J, which is P41, P21, right here, so lies outside, then the convention has to be, uh, of this, has to be negative, okay? Um, which, which means, uh, right, that, that, uh, you know, theta, um, uh, yeah, theta uh, 2 and theta 4 are moving in the same direction, okay? Um, but if, uh, or sorry, sorry, if it, it, it has to be positive. If it lies between them, it has to be positive. So if it's positive, they're moving in the same direction, okay? Because um, obviously, if, if the kinematic coefficient is, is positive, that means the ratio of the output to the input is positive, which means they're both going the same direction. And you remember from our convention, if they're both going the same direction, the instant center has to be outside of this, this, uh, these limits. So you just check if this is outside these, then you know that's a positive value. If it's between them, if it lies between them, then you can know that uh, there, the, the sign is negative, and that means when theta 2 is positive, theta 4 is negative. Or if theta 2 is negative, theta 4 is positive, okay? But in this case, of course, it doesn't lie between them, so they're the same direction at this instant. Okay? So if you follow this convention, you can me know what to measure and what, how to calculate this. You can find the sign that it should be, and then you times it by omega 2, and you've got velocity analysis. Okay? So let's do another example and show that this works for many different cases. Okay? So say we want to find, um, say, say we take a vector that points from this point to that point. That's RP2, P21. That's the instant center there, that's the instant center there, 
P23, okay? And uh, say we want to find the velocity of this point, then you use the velocity difference equation to march from this point to that point. You do VP21, which is zero, plus omega two cross this vector, okay, which would be a velocity in that direction, right? That's the velocity of that point, okay? And even though that was a velocity on two, it's also the velocity of that point on three because they're coincidence of pin joint, okay? So if we want to find the velocity of this point on three, we'd find the velocity of that point on three, which is the same velocity we just calculated here, so you plug that into there, and add it to now omega three, which is the angular velocity of three, cross this vector pointing from there to there, and that would tell you the velocity of that point, okay? And what do you know about the velocity of that point? Well, you know because that's the instant center between one and three, that's the point on three that would have the same velocity as if that point was on one, and one is the ground. So every point on the ground is zero, so that means this has to be zero, okay? So this is zero, you take that first one, plug it in there, and if you then do the cross products, recognizing all the omegas are perpendicular to their position difference vectors, um, then you'd find this equation up here on the top right is the case. Okay, and now if you recall that theta three prime is omega three over omega two, then you could rearrange that equation on the right and find that omega three divided by omega two equals this, where this sign is negative. Okay, so that was a way that we didn't use the convention I just taught you, but we just used that vector approach that we initially used. Uh, to find this, but, but again, it's kind of tricky because it's like, well, how did you know to march from here to here and then from there to there and to use these vectors and we could have used other ones and, and uh, you know, if you, if you mess around long enough, you could find uh, how, to, how to derive this, but, um, it, you know, it's, it's just wiser to use this convention and that's the exact same convention up there on the right and you'll see, um, even though we changed j to 3, so we wanted to find theta 3 prime, the whole convention still works. And you can see here, it's P1i, which is 1, 2, is still the input is still 2. So here it is, P1, 2. And then P2, 3 is right here. So this numerator is that same numerator. Okay? And, um, and this, uh, the, the denominator, P1, 3, is right here, or J, and P2, uh, yeah, 2, 3 is right there. So you can see it's the same thing. So in this case, you would, if you, if you, if you want to do all that vector nonsense and velocity difference equation, you could, uh, if you knew what you were doing, but you don't need to do that. You can just look up this convention or it's written on a cheat sheet or something. And uh, if you know that I is the input variable and J is the output variable, then you just find, you, you measure them. You would measure uh, this distance in this case, and then you would measure this distance in this case, which are distances between instant centers you found, you divide them, and you know the answer. Now, the trick is with this one is it doesn't really use, um, so, so you found the right magnitude of the kinematic coefficient, but the sign, we, we knew the sign is negative because we did that vector approach and we solved it to be negative, which means, by the way, that if theta two is positive, that means theta three will be negative. And you can visualize that if, if this, in this instant where it's in this configuration, if this starts moving, this point will move down, this point will move kind of up. So you can imagine it's kind of rotating negative to two. Um, and so uh, you could either, to find the sign, you could either do all that vector stuff, which I don't recommend, and you'd get the right sign, or you can just use your intuition on this and visualize, do they go in opposite directions? But at least you get the magnitude from this approach. Okay, but you can't use that other convention where things lie outside because you know we're not using two things stuck to the ground um, for this. But but no matter what your situation is, no matter what your mechanism, this convention will work to get you the magnitude of the first order kinetic coefficient. Then when you can intuit or visualize the sign, you multiply it by omega of the input, omega two in this case, and you would get omega three. Okay. So now let's look at a totally different mechanism to just show you how this would work. Um, and, and we're almost there, so let's, uh, and this is what I just said, just multiply omega 2 by that. Okay, so let's look at the, um, uh, right, the, the, the slider mechanism here. Okay, um, 
Uh, we, you know, we, from a previous example, we already found all six instant centers. You can see them in red there. And um, let's, let's first use that, you know, instead of using a convention, let's use that vector approach because this is a little trick. This, this uh, breaks from the convention a little bit, but you'll see. But let's, let's just, you know, ignore that I just said that. Let's just use the vector approach. And um, let's, let's define this vector, the points uh, from P21 to uh, 24, okay? And um, if you want to find this point, P24, as if it were stuck on 2, the velocity of it, you would find the velocity of P21, which is 0, because it's stuck right there. You take omega 2 and cross it to that, and that would get the velocity if it were stuck on 4. Okay? And, or sorry, if it were stuck on 2. But you know, because that is the instant center, P24, that's the, that's the point where if it was on 2, it would have the same velocity as a point on 4. And you know 4 is going this way, so you know this equals 4. So we're already jumping to the solution pretty quickly here. Okay, so if you did um, cross products, you know these are perpendicular, you would find that the scalar here times the scalar here equals the velocity. And um, if you recall that this first order kinematic coefficient is r prime 4, uh, you know it's velocity of 4 divided by omega 2. Okay, because remember, if you times this by omega 2, it equals that. And if you did the derivatives here, d, uh, um, if, you know, if you did dr4 divided by delta t and, and d uh, theta2 divided by delta t, the delta t's would cancel, and you, you'd have dr4 uh, divided by d theta2, which is the, also the textbook definition of this. So you can, you can drive that. So you can see, because this equals this, and you know this, you could just take that and divide it, and you find the first order kinetic coefficient is just one length. It's not even a ratio, okay? And it happens to be that red length up there, right up here, the length of that. So if you have this mechanism and you wanted to find um, the velocity of 4, the output velocity, it is assuming it's drawn to scale, you just get a ruler and measure this distance between those two instant centers, and you get that and you times it by omega 2, and you have the velocity. Now, if, again, the sign, you have to intuit from uh, the picture. And of course, as this is omega 2 positive, this will be, this will be going in that direction, the negative direction, OK? OK, but, um, okay, but, but this is, um, and, and by the way, that, yeah, the negative sign is embedded in there, so, OK. But, but anyway, um, so you notice this breaks from the convention. And the reason it breaks from the convention is because this is not a theta output. Anytime, if you ever have a theta output and a theta input, right, then you're going to use, let's go back here, you're going to use this convention here. Okay, and the, the last two examples use that. And so you're going you're gonna to have to measure two different distances and find the ratio. Okay, but when you go to, if you do a, a uh, display, if you have a kinematic coefficient, that is a um, displacement output divided by a theta input, then you're just going to use, you just have to measure one thing. And the, and the, and the um, uh, convention is this, where if you notice, this right here is just the numerator of the past convention. So you really only have to memorize one thing. If you memorize the last convention, then if you get one of these first order kinematic coefficients that involves displacement, you just use the same convention's numerator. Okay, and let's confirm that that's correct. This is P1. In this case, the input is 2. So we have P21 there. And then in this case, it's Pij, which the, it's input of 2 and output of 4. And so, yep, P24, there it is. That tells you what to measure. And then you do the, um, uh, you ins you, it, the, the sign is found by inspection. OK. So that's how you do it. Um, let, let me just do a quick review. You know, if I give you a mechanism drawn to scale, you uh, quickly find the number of instant centers using that equation. You find the obvious ones, and then you find the non-obvious uh, at the joints, and then you find the non-obvious ones using Arnold Kennedy. And then when you have all the instant centers, you use those two conventions. Uh, depending on what kind of kinematic coefficient output you want, you either do a numerator divided by denominator or just the numerator. And it tells you, if you follow that convention, what distances to measure between the instant centers you found. 
and then you usually do the sine by convention, and then you times it by the input angular velocity, and you got the output. So that's velocity analysis using instant centers. Okay, and that's kind of a graphical approach. So we have, uh, you know, analytical methods which don't do first order kinematic coefficients, which you definitely need to do. It's probably the best approach. And then you have the instant center Arnold Kennedy theorem to find uh, velocity analysis graphically. Okay, so I'm just going to do a couple other little methods that are useful, and you kind of already know them. Okay, um, but uh, the question is, what if? What if you wanted to find the velocity of a point on a mechanism? Okay, so so say it's some arbitrary. So far, we've only found uh, the you know omega three or v four you know of, of mechanisms that um, uh, you know of the links themselves. But what if you want to find the velocity of a specific point on a specific link? Um, and you know you, you probably have the math skills to figure out how you would do this, but let me show you a systematic approach to do this. Okay, first it's important to know if you want to do this, if you want to find the velocity of d, this point d, on some mechanism, you need to do position analysis first, obviously. So you know for some given theta two what theta three and r four are for this slider crank mechanism, and then um, you need to do velocity analysis second. So you actually have to finish velocity analysis. Um, according to how I just taught, so I give you for that position, now you know theta 3 and R4, now I give you some omega 2, and you find omega 3 and V4. And once you have those two things, then you are uh, able to find the velocity at this point. So you need to kind of complete velocity analysis as I've taught so far, and then this is the final step, and you have all the information you need to find any, uh, the velocity of any point on any link. Okay. So first thing you do is if we're going to find the velocity at this point, assuming we know theta three, r four, omega three, and v four, and omega two, and omega and, and uh, theta two, right? Okay. So if you know all that, then what you do is you use what you know. You you do r two plus a new vector r five that goes along this vector. Okay. But notice it's going in a different direction. This was we drew this going up here. This one's drawing there. So this plus this. <coughs> excuse me equals rd, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, you can write this in component form, right? And, and you get xd, yd, that's the displacement, or that's the you know, position of xd and yd in the two component form as a function of stuff we already know, okay? And so what you could do is you could, if you want to do, find the velocity of that point, you have the position of it, so just take the derivative of it with respect to time. And uh, if you did that, you'd find, you know, you take this xd, take the derivative with respect to time, you'd get that, where recall, don't get tripped up by this, theta 3, remember this, this vector points from that point to there. So theta 3, you go from the tail and you go around this way, that's theta 3. Theta 5, its tail is over here, its arrowhead's there, so you go there to there. So theta 5 is actually theta 3 plus pi. Theta 3 plus pi is 5. So that kind of switches the direction of the vector and makes, remember, you know theta 3 because you solved that from position analysis. And so now you know theta 5. And of course, you know the distance of, you know, the magnitude of this, r5, which is just d, or yeah, little d, they gave that to you. Or you could just get a ruler and measure it, right? So you know that, okay? And so you could, if you take the derivative of these things and you know, plug this stuff in, you have your answer. The velocity of that, and you take the derivative of yd, yd dot, you get that. And again, uh, practice this, check my math, and make sure you can do the derivatives with respect to time. And you'd have the answer. And those are all with respect to things you know if you've done position and velocity analysis. Notice there's a theta 3 and an omega 3 and omega 2 and theta 2 in there. All that stuff you know if you've done position and velocity analysis. So you're done at that point. But again, I wouldn't recommend doing this approach because in this class we never take derivatives with respect to time. Um, it's much wiser to take derivatives with respect to the input variable. Okay? So another thing you could do is take this component form of the vector that points to the point of interest and take the derivatives of them with respect to the input variable. So you can put me on pause or whatever, or I'm about to show you the answer. You take the derivative of both of these with respect to the input variable, 
and you get this equation, okay? And if you do, so, and, and by the way, that's xd prime now. It's not xd dot, because that would be derivative xd with respect to time. But this is prime up there, and so that's derivative xd with respect to theta 2, okay? And, uh, and if you do the same thing with yd, uh, you get this, okay? And, and by the way, note, if you take the derivative, because theta 5 equals theta 3 plus pi, if you take the derivative of theta 5 with respect to theta 2, uh, you know, then, it, it, then you'll find it equals the derivative of theta 3 with respect to theta 2 plus 0, because pi doesn't change as a function of theta 2, thank goodness, or the world would come collapsing down, right? So this is 0. Okay, so theta 5 prime equals theta 3 prime. Okay, which you know. You know theta 3 prime, right? So, so um, <clears throat> now, okay, because you, do, you did, you did uh, velocity analysis, so uh, presumably you know not only theta 2 because we gave it to you, but we know theta 3 from position analysis, and you know theta 3 prime because you found the first order kinematic coefficients when you did uh, velocity analysis, and you, you don't need to immediately jump to omega 3 now. So it's, it's a little easier, it's a little quicker to do this. And then uh, all you do is times these values, xd prime by the input variable, omega 2, okay? And yd prime by omega 2, and you have the velocity uh, components um, of, of, uh, of d. And you can see there, you know, we're just proving that xd prime times omega 2 uh, does indeed equal xd dot or with respect to time because of the chain rule. Same thing with, with yd. But you can review that to convince yourself. So again, the method I recommend is uh, do, uh, absolutely do everything for position and velocity analysis. Find all the, the, you know, complete all that. And then find, use vectors you already know to point to whatever point of interest on the mechanism you're interested in. And then uh, break those into the component form. Take the derivative of those with respect to the input variable, not with respect to time, and then times those by the input variable angular velocity, so uh, omega 2. Or if it's, uh, if it's the linear velocity, it would be v4 or something, right, that you times it by. Whatever the input variable is, use that. Okay, and then you have the, uh, the velocity analysis uh, of a single point. And here is the final velocity of d. It's that x component y component, uh, first order kinetic coefficients times omega 2. Okay. Okay, so that's, that's one way you can find the velocity of a mechanism on a point once you've done uh, position velocity analysis. Another kind of more direct and almost easier approach sometimes um, is if you use the velocity difference equation to hop from point to point. Okay? So say you have a four bar and you want to, and you've, you, you know, you've solved position and velocity, and I gave you some theta 2 and I gave you some omega 2 and you've solved for theta 4, theta 3, and omega 3, and omega 4, and you want to find the velocity of that point, d, on the mechanism. Well, like I said, you could do the exact same approach I just taught you, use first order kinetic coefficients and all that stuff, but let's use the velocity difference equation this way because it's, it's another alternative. It might be a faster way on an exam or in reality to, to do this. So let's start here and take the velocity of that plus omega 2 cross r2, and that would be now the velocity of a on 2. Okay, this is obviously 0. You know this, you know that, so now you know this. You now know that's also the velocity of a on 3, and so you take that, plug it in there, and plus it to omega 3 cross r5. And you could solve r5 as, as being opposite, it's theta 3 plus, all right, or, uh, yeah, um, it, yeah, in this case, it's theta 3, which goes from here to there. So here, here's, our, uh, you know, theta 5 is from this tail to there. It's this little sliver, whereas theta 3 is here. So you do theta 3 minus pi to get that little sliver, and that is, is what relates to those. And, of course, if you take the derivative of these with respect to time, pi goes to 0 as well, and omega 5 equals omega 3, right? So, um, Right, so instead of, you know, we put omega 5 or omega 3 here, it doesn't matter. But anyway, you can see we have all this information, and bam, you get right out the velocity of d, both components x and y. Okay, so uh, congratulations. That's essentially topic 3. 
Um, these are overview slides that kind of summarize uh, the entire topic um, with uh, conventions and, and with variables and, and things. So I do encourage you to, on your own time to look through these and read these. If you understand these uh, slides, then you've understood uh, everything in topic three. And uh, that uh, concludes um, this topic. So we'll see you in topic four.